Hi, everyone. It's helpful if I unmute myself. Uh, my name is Megan Hicklin. I'm the Exhibitions Program Manager of the Moss Arts Center. And I want to welcome all of you to In the Moment. Um, this is a series that we put on here at the Moss Arts Center that features and celebrates our local artists here in the New River Valley. And today we're very happy to welcome Martha Olson. Um, just a few technical notes before we get started. Um, I encourage all of you to set your view in Zoom to speaker mode. Um, that uh, will put the, the person who is currently speaking, which would mostly be Martha, um, onto your full screen. Um, and also this talk is being recorded. Um, if you do not wish to be recorded, you can either turn off your camera or you're, you're welcome to leave the talk, but I do hope this day. Um, we will have a question and answer um, moment at the end of this talk, and um, we will be doing that through chat, through the chat feature um, on Zoom, um, and I'll um, prompt you for questions as we go through the talk. Um, hopefully, we'll have time to get through all of them. And um, until that time, we ask you please do keep your microphone muted. Um, that way, the, everyone can clearly hear the, the conversation as we go through. Um, so just a brief introduction about Martha. Um, she is having one heck of a summer this year. Um, not only is she featured in our current exhibition, Roots, Reeds, and Vines, The Art of Basketry, um, she is also best in show at the BRAA juried exhibition called Place, which is currently on view at the Perspective Gallery in the Squire Student Center here on campus. Um, we are um, very, very thrilled to talk with her. Um, she uh, is a 2D artist as well as a 3D artist. Um, today we'll be featuring uh, or focusing mainly on her 3D work um, because her, her vessels are, are what's featured in our exhibition here. But we'll be talking to her about kind of her her process, her inspirations, and and we'll just have you know a very lighthearted, informal conversation because we're all thrilled to be back out in the world talking about art with real life people. So um, I encourage you to have a great time, um, and again, keep questions coming. And um, without further ado, let's um, bring Martha in. So Martha, unmute yourself and come on in. <laughs> Did that work? Yes. Hi, Martha. How are you now? <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing today? I'm doing very, very well. It's a beautiful day. And I so agree with you. It's finally nice to kind of be in a more normal atmosphere and world and see and enjoy everything that we once so much took for granted. I think we really appreciate it a lot more these days. I know, I certainly do. <laughs> uh, so let's let's start kind of from the beginning. Um, how how did you get into to art? What role did creativity kind of play in your childhood, or when, when did it start coming out of you? Well, um, as a child, I was always making things, whether it was out of paper or in a sandbox, or um, I did a lot of sewing. And I just needed to have a creative outlet, but I guess as a child, I didn't really understand what that meant. And um, I became more interested in, in doing artwork as I got older. And um, it was not encouraged by my parents as far as education. So I went to college and did um, career and um, degrees that would hopefully make me an earning and they did. Um, I was employed in the outside world, if you want to call that, of art uh, with a, a master's in uh, public administration. So I worked in child care and the health industry for oh, a good um, 10, 15 years. Um, so I had this desire to do artwork and um, my parents, I think, <laughs> kind of gave me some leeway by letting me paint the dining room orange and then the bathroom black. And I think they realized I really didn't have any talent after all. <laughs> <laughs> so I set everything aside and, and went to the university and had my family and um, took care of things that I needed to take care of as we all have in life. 
And um, then it became easier for me to explore doing artwork, especially when we moved back to Virginia. And um, my outlet at that time was doing custom sewing and interior design work for people. Uh, I did not do any more orange dining rooms or black bathrooms. So I, I learned my lesson on that one. <laughs> <laughs> but I, still wanted, I still wanted to do something in the art world and um, I had uh, acquaintances that are in the area and we just started doing artwork together as play days and so forth and I just kind of stumbled around in different mediums until I found paper which began the 2D collage type work that I've been doing for quite a few years now. And out of that, I really wanted to do 3D work. And I have done some installations and a variety of things, but nothing that really was consistent until I started with the rag rugs and making the vessels. And um, I think I have finally found home mm. with this medium and I'm enjoying it quite a lot. So I have um, the the, most of the works that we have on view in the exhibition are the rag rug vessels. Um, and I'm gonna show a couple. Um, so if you're not on speaker view, you may not see me, but I'm waving my hands right here. And I do have gloves on. Um, we have here, this is flask. I'm gonna try and give you a little view. So if anyone grew up, I, I did, um, my grandmother would make rag rugs out of old clothing. Um, this this is, you know, a, a kind of a traditional craft. I don't want to call it craft, but it, it was um, something born out of necessity, you know, to keep the floors warm, you know, to keep the house warm and to repurpose old old textiles. You know, so tell me where these rag rugs came and how they came into your life. Well, um, my husband's from Sweden and in Oh, it wasn't that long ago, 1920s, 30s. Houses were poorly constructed, very drafty. Um, Sweden wasn't a very wealthy country. And out of necessity, old clothes were taken and cut up, woven together to make rugs for the floors to try to bring some comfort to the home. And um, the townhome community that my husband's family lived in had a multi-purpose uh, room in the basement where everyone who lived in that building could come and do their laundry, uh, work on arts and craft large projects. And they had tremendous floor looms where women would come with their rags and put these rugs on the loom and weave them. And Thomas actually, Thomas is my husband, actually helped his mother make some of these rugs. So when we set up housekeeping, uh, she gifted me several of these rugs and they were just beautiful. You know, time produces different colors and fashions and quality of fabrics and which we don't have today. So when you put these together, they just are extremely unique. And she had a very good sense of color as well. So um, when my son and his wife set up housekeeping, I thought, well, this would be nice to pass these along. And I gave them several of their rugs, of my rugs. And unknown to me, their dog was very happy to claw them apart. <laughs> and I could not just throw them out. So they, the shreds came back and lived in my closet for many years until I had a eureka moment of what to do with them. <laughs> and so now they are repurposed in vessels and they're going back to my children in a different shape. <laughs> and so this one, and forgive my, you can correct my pronunciation, is Tvakvina? Yeah, Tvakina, yeah. Gina, okay, thank you. Gina. Um, yeah. Which means washwoman? Washerwoman, yeah. To woman, yeah, um, and we had an interesting conversation yesterday about um, the the kind of the same area that these women would gather the multi-purpose room mm -hmm, yes. uh, to do their weaving. They would do their washing, uh, which started this this conversation about women's work. Yes. Um, to, um, tell me a little bit about that. Well, the naming the naming of this kind of honors um, 
that room and those activities um, for, and you can see there's like the dark brown for the dirt maybe, and the blue for the water and cleaning. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, they didn't use rocks back then to, <laughs> to clean <laughs> up the, their garments, but um, women are often um, the laborers for washing clothes, um, mending garments, taking care of the household. And it was very uh, important work and it had to be done and it took a long time. And the only way women could have maybe a communal gathering and it, you know, be of support for each other was to take these activities and do them together in a group setting. Mm -hmm. So that along came with you know, child care and um, taking care of the family and also being a network for them. Of course, back in those days, they had the time because we didn't have the, the TV and the internet as distractions. Nobody had any money. So everybody came together and it was a commonality among very many groups of people. And there's a, you know, a beautiful connection between the basket or the vessel and the woman as a vessel, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, physiologically, and then, you know, the woman carrying the wash load, carrying, carrying, you know, in a traditional sense, this is general, you know, I'm not trying to be sexist or anything, but, but in a traditional sense, you know, ca carrying children, carrying groceries, carrying laundry, all in all of those traditional ways, um, carrying stories, carrying mm -hmm. memories, um, just like, just like these do. Mm -hmm. I mean, these already have have so many stories in them of of your your mother-in-law and then going to the the children and the dogs and then the stories they're acquiring now of of where all of these are going to travel and then yeah. how they're going to go back to your children and um you know that's the beautiful thing about material things mm -hmm. you know they they carry stories they carry memories you know just like people do so i think it's it's a beautiful connection well, thank you. I, I think you are so right in, um, and this is my also my connection to doing these is that people say they're baskets. And I said, yes, you can look at them like that, but baskets kind of infer that they have some kind of utilitarian purpose. And these are not um, utilitarian at all. And so they're more keeping and holding of memories, ideas, secrets, um, just space, whatever you might want to infer. And so in that way, they are um, materially not functional, but they are ones that carry and hold. And that is also a description for a vessel. So that's why I refer to them as vessels. And women carry an awful lot of that through their lives. Yes. And they're so, you know, only because I'm wearing gloves, but they're so tactile. I mean, they're, you know, we we were talking about touching fabric and, right. you know, that kind of cruising through the fabric store and just, uh, you, know, <laughs> uh, you know, and just, you know, feeling them. It, it brings back the memory of like lay, laying on, you know, my grandmother's floor and mm -hmm. feeling that kind of nubby carpet or, you know, or feeling a quilt or feeling something she tatted or, you know, and, and it's like a smell, you know, mm -hmm. all of us have that you smell something and it takes you instantly somewhere else. The memory, yeah. You know, the, these can do the same thing, you know, and, and you know, baskets, bas basketry in general can do that of remembering that, that feeling. But if you come in the gallery, don't touch it. <laughs> I'll give you a glove. I'll give you a glove and you can touch it. <laughs> or, or go to Martha, call Martha and go to Martha's yeah. house. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Um, I did want to touch on um, your kind of transition or your, I don't want to say transition because you're still playing back and forth with paper, 2D, 3D. Um, this piece, um, which is Victoria, um, which is paper, which is incredible um, to me because it's, I mean, it's so fabric like, you know, in its, its feel and it's how, how well it holds. Um, about, um, tell me more about how you kind of play back and forth with 2D and 3D. And I also want to um, talk about kind of the, if you can see the ornamentation on here, the beadwork, 
and then you know some of your pieces have little have jewelry they're they're dressed up um about about that like what you know is there a decision making process to that or you know what what's happening there <laughs> <laughs> um the that's actually a brown grocery paper bag mm -hmm. that has multiple layers of acrylic paint on them and by mm. doing that the paper bag almost becomes leather like yeah. and has more stability and also flexibility which of course when you're working with uh, making a basket you have to uh, fold and manipulate the pieces so many times and i think an ordinary paper bag wouldn't be able to withstand all that yeah. uh, manipulation and this was just finding a way to take this paper and make it 3d mm -hmm. um, and it became an exploration that finally i perfected enough that i'm able to make these types of vessels uh, they're very time consuming i must say that um, they are twined together with a uh, black linen and um, they're very free form as I go along it, they kind of take their own shape I can um, persuade it here and there but it really just um, takes on the nature of the material itself the beading um, came from the idea of it just didn't look quite finished when I thought I was done. And a couple of years ago, we went to uh, Botswana and I was able to pick up beads and trinkets and so forth on our journey, kind of like a crow, you know, I collect these things, don't know what I'm going to do with them. I just put them away. And so when I came back, I was looking at this, uh, vessel, which I called Victoria after Queen Victoria from Victoria Falls. You can see it was pretty influential that visit, the beading, the high collar. Yeah. Yeah. Then the, the ornament of the, the brass and aluminum beads, uh, trading beads from um, Zimbabwe that I um, able to sew along the edge of the collar. I wanted that look and I hope I achieved it. I have a couple others in that series and they are also named after Queens. So oh, that makes that makes absolute sense now. I mean, I see the, the yeah. Hot color. Yeah. And it, it I mean, there it, it doesn't look at all like paper. I mean, there's not a tear or a fray at anywhere in it. And it looks like I mean, it's iridescent. I don't know if it comes through on on camera. But it, I mean, it looks like patina copper. I mean, it's it's absolutely gorgeous, and and it does kind of feel like leather. Um, but it's beautiful turquoise on the inside. But it's it's gorgeous. It's absolutely stunning. So I, I love how you were able to manipulate the paper to make it a fabric. <laughs> Me too. You will have, you will have your fabric. Yeah. <laughs> I don't there. know how it happened. It just happened. <laughs> And that, that's the you know a beautiful thing we were talking about you know process and this idea of kind of challenging the idea of the artist as you just kind of pop out of the womb and you know holding a paintbrush and just genius flows you know and and there's no mistakes there's no you just know what to do you mm -hmm. know intrinsically you know but that's how you know so much brilliance happens is you didn't know what was going to happen and you happened upon you know a, a, a signature technique now um and and i think that's a, a beautiful thing about creativity and about experimentation um it it leads you down these roads that you weren't even really looking for and and you come up with that <laughs> so <Yeah. just> bravo <laughs> sometimes i surprise myself <laughs> <laughs> that's the best that's the best yeah. I think also that uh, we were talking yesterday a little bit about different mediums and um, I've tried different mediums like watercolor, acrylic, oils, and I just don't have the, the kind of patience for it because there's a lot of rules with painting and I'm, I don't follow rules very well. I do obey 
but I don't follow rules. <laughs> so the, the paper and the, the rag rugs give me freedom and I can make happy accidents and it's still okay. If you don't follow the rules and the techniques with painting, it's not okay. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it's when you break the rules that, that innovation happens. Exactly, exactly. It's, it's like, um, you know, making good trouble, that kind of thing, you know, to apply it to the arts. It's, you know, it, it, you don't want to keep replicating what someone else has already done. You've got to, you've got to, you know, color outside the lines kind of a thing. So, so yeah, I, you're after my own heart. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, what, uh, where do you draw some of your, your inspiration from? Um, out, outside of your studio. I, think so. um, <laughs> yeah. I spend a lot of time walking and just um, observing and looking at nature, not with any purpose in mind, just as a way of, I don't know, um, filing those images away in my brain somewhere. I don't do sketchbooks. I, I never could quite, uh, I guess maybe that's kind of a rule thing. I don't know. But I I just seem to accumulate all these colors, shapes, ideas. And then when I have enough, I guess, information in my um, brain somewhere, whether it's the right or the left side, I really don't know where it comes from. <laughs> then I can begin to make things and it, it just comes pouring out in whatever I'm doing. Hmm. So it's... um. It's rather interesting. Also, I get a lot of inspiration from magazines. I love all kinds of magazines. People give me all kinds of magazines and I spend hours, if you wanna call that, uh, researching. <laughs> it's kind of like my library, my references. And um, again, it's the fashion colors from one year uh, to the next, what seems to be you know, uh, triggering certain things and it, it is, it's actually a feeling that I get that, oh, this is right. These things go together and mm -hmm. color drives more of my work than anything else. Um, not so much the line or the structure or whatever. It's, it's driven pretty much by color. Mm. I do, I see that. Like I see how they're, you know, tonally, you know, kind of uh, congruent. Like they're, they're, they'll all kind of, you know, be in a, an earth tone or like a, a, a green tone or something like that. Um, how, you know, and I, I've been, I, I look forward to the day where I, I don't have to ask this question um, of, of artists that it'll be a distant, you know, distant memory soon. But um, with everything that happened last year, for those of you who don't know, um, this exhibition was supposed to happen last summer. And, you know, things happened and um, we were not able to, to produce this show, you know, for, for public safety reasons and all of that. Um, but we were able to, to have it this year, all of the artists that, that had committed to the show, um, to my memory, I think uh, remained committed to, to the exhibition, which is amazing. Um, and uh, we were really fortunate to have a full opening, a public opening with a reception and all that. But, um, the, the past year has affected a lot of artists in a lot of different ways. Um, how, if at all, did it affect you? Um, it, it was really startling, like deer in the headlights sort of moment when I started to see um, shows being canceled, um, travel not happening, and the uh, workshops falling off the calendar and you just kind of feel like you're uh, unmoored. Um, everything that was anchoring that year just evaporated. I know some artists that was a wonderful freeing time for them and they just, you know, went into super mode, functioning, creating, and um, having a really good time with being in their studios um, in a solitary kind of atmosphere. For me, it was, it was paralyzing. I just really 
uh, struggled with getting back into the studio. And I made small goals every day just to be in the room, whether I did anything or not. Um, I just had to keep that habit going. And it's only been recently that I've been able to start to create. You can't force a creative process. It, it just doesn't work. So to have, I guess maybe it's the mental calm, the, the headspace to come back and do the work um, has started to happen again. And I'm very, very pleased with that because I do have a show coming up in September and I'm not so panicked about it right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd, I'd say you, you made a triumphant return to creativity with, with the, you know, the spring and the summer that you're having. It's yeah, like I mean, the, the year of Martha. <laughs> 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 so, so I'd, I'd say you, 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 you've made a great recovery. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know where I go from here, dear. We'll just see. <laughs> I'd, I'd say like you're, you know, up and cruising, like I think you're doing pretty good. <laughs> so um, we have a couple of questions. If you have questions for Martha, send them to me in the chat window and I will, I will call on you. Or if you're not comfortable being called on, let me know. I, I get it. Um, but I, I will call on you. Um, any more questions? Send me some questions. Don't be shy. But we'll start with Laura. Um, Laura, if you want to unmute yourself, you can go ahead and ask your question. Hi, um, I was just wondering if you mainly use cotton fabrics or if you prefer linen or what your preferences are. Um, I prefer to work with natural fabrics if I can. Um, they just seem to be more, um, coherent, if you want to call that, and work better together than uh, polyester or artificial fabrics. Also, the um, more natural fabrics uh, will hold together in the process better than the slicker kind of polyester or nylons. And that goes with the um, type of thread that I use as well. I have not been successful using um, man-made kind of fibers or I don't prefer, I prefer not to use them. Plus they just don't have a look, you know, they don't have that um, patina. Yeah. And Laura is also a fellow rule breaker. She does, she does not care for sketchbooks either. So. Oh, good. <laughs> Found a tribe member. <laughs> <laughs> See, I have another question from Molly. Molly, you want to unmute yourself, answer, and ask your question? Um, I was just wondering, um, and by the way, they're beautiful. And um, they, I, I found myself initially thinking of the quilts that I have from my um, family um, that I love and treasure. Um, so that your stories made me think of that, but, um, how much do you, how do you really see these, these vessels in the context of this particular exhibit as far as the contribution to basket making? Are they an extension of basket making, do you feel, or are they sort of an expression of another form um, that is um, beside basket making or along with basket making? Oh, that's an interesting question. I guess I, I would, I have to tell you, I was um, rather surprised uh, to be included in the show. And if you have seen the show, which it sounds like you have, there's a wide variety of different techniques and materials used. Uh, some of them are more utilitarian, others are just purely art forms or sculptures. And um, I was really tickled to see that they brought all that together in this show and just didn't take one narrow slice of uh, what basket might mean to some people. Say the, the split oak, you know, with a very traditional Appalachian basket. Um, then that kind of reinforced the idea and the, the experiences that I have had going and looking at different basket makers works and shows and just being 
totally surprised with what people use to produce and make a shape or a vessel. You know, uh, long ago it was reeds um, that were twined together and ropes and, you know, woven together and sticks, very primitive kind of materials. And now you can go and look at baskets being made with um, plastic cording, uh, electrical wires. Um, let's see, what are some of the other fun things I've seen? You know, you got clothespins in clo one of the clothespin basket falls <laughs> right into that. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, mesh wire that people have, you know, somehow, I don't know how they do it without cutting their fingers, uh, woven those into baskets. So it, it, I think we need to maybe open our minds and look at what a basket might actually be and not give it such a tight definition. And that is just coming around in the current or contemporary world. I think before it was very much a traditional, this is a basket and everything else is something else. Thank you. You're welcome. I think that's, um, I think that's what we were going for. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It's kind of joining the craft and the art uh, mm -hmm. definitions together, fine art together. Mm -hmm. And finally, basketry is being noticed as fine art. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, if you haven't seen the show, um, please do come see it. It's uh, it's open until August 28th. And um, it really is kind of a voyage from from traditional to to the unexpected. Um, and and it, it, it does show kind of a wide variety between functional and, and sculptural and you know, vessels that can hold things, vessels that couldn't possibly hold things. And, and it really is, um, you know, I, I, I give great credit to our curator, Margaret Crutchfield, who's, who's here with us and she, she's, she's piping up, she's piping up in the chat. Um, but uh, for, for, you know, as you said, not, not ascribing to, a, you know, a, a narrow idea of, of basketry, but really looking at it as, as woven sculpture. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 kind of being open to to every expression of that um, through time, through you know different geographic locations, um, and the response to it has been been really great. And we're just we're thrilled to have people in the galleries, you know, and, and be doing what we're what we what we do, you know, what we love to do. Um, it is last year last year was difficult, you know, you know for for people who create and then the people who 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 show off what people create you know it was it was hard not talking about art for for a long time so so we're 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 very happy right now um more questions do we have any more questions for martha S send it to we have a thank you is it terry Terry, you can you can unmute and talk, Terry. <laughs> Don't be shy. Uh, you're asking a lot here. This is I, I should know how to do this by now. You're yeah, good. Yeah, I think I'm here. Yeah, I was just saying thank you to Martha for always being so genuine and and her clarity and I want to say simplicity, but that's the wrong word. It's just so her art is so accessible and her uh, way of being is so accessible to I think artists in general, um, and it kind of gives us. Uh, well, it gives me um, always a little direction of a little push to go ahead. It's it's always very nice. I always enjoy enjoy listening to you very much, Martha. Thank, well, you. thank you. Your baskets are your vessels are beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Right, one last call. Oh wait, here's some. Ah, Margaret, Margot, go ahead, unmute yourself. All right, so what's the craziest form you ever imagined you might think of, create, bring into life? Oh, that's interesting. I have several kind of um, swirling around in my head right now. Um, I would like to work with the rag rug material and make a 2D, 3D installation 
that would um, be on the wall. So it wouldn't be flat against the wall, but come out from the wall. And it would take quite a bit of time and an awful lot of uh, engineering, but uh, that is a goal that I have. When it will happen, I don't know. <laughs> Call me. <laughs> okay, okay. I, I want people to understand that, um, you know, baskets look simple maybe or um, intriguing. And the other thing is the, the time consuming and detail that goes into the work. If you have a, one of the baskets that has been made that's in the exhibit that's e extremely um, detailed with a color and a shape and those have been incredible hours that the artist has spent uh, making those. Um, my works are much smaller and free form, but you know they, they take me months to do. And um, I have a great appreciation for the work that's in there and what has been required by those artists to produce those, especially the ones that harvest their own fibers and then create a basket out of it that that is just amazing work yeah yeah i think the commercialization of of and mass production of some mm -hmm. of the things like you can go to hobby Lobby or michael's or wherever and and grab a basket for 10 bucks and it it there's the distance between it of oh it's a ba it's just a basket i'm gonna go put my bananas in it or whatever and you there's a disconnect between the actual Craft, the hand crafting of it, regardless of what the medium is. Mm -hmm. And you know, to really look at these and think of someone, every single, you know, you know, is it warp and weft? That's fabric, right? The every single, um, you know, weave is by hand with a not so friendly material a lot of times where it's, it's digging in your hands, it's cutting your hands, your hands are aching. Um, it, it's, it's incredible. It is absolutely mind-blowingly incredible. Some of these baskets take up to a year to make. Um, and that's something that deserves to be celebrated and preserved. Um, you know, the traditional ways and then, you know, the the, the new innovations that come along um, that, that honor the tradition and then, you know, expand upon it. Um, it it's something that is, is worthy of, of praise and worthy of people, you know, learning more about it. And, and you're part of that. And we, we absolutely appreciate that. Well, thank you. Let's see, we have another comment. We're, all, we're almost, oh, we have one more question. Lisa, come on, Lisa. Hi, uh, it's Lisa. Thank you so much. This is such a fantastic um, chat. I'm really happy to um, see you, Martha. Your work is stunning. Um, I've, I've been to the exhibition, but only had time to go into the, the one gallery upstairs where, where you are right now, Megan, and um, only had time to look at your work, Martha. So I just so was so pleased that you were gonna be the one featured here today. But I, I was thinking, when I was looking at what you call Victoria, that, that piece with the paper in the bag, I was struck by, when I was looking at it in person, I was struck by how, um, I don't, I don't really, I'm not exactly sure how to say it, how perfect it was in the sense that it just seemed like it was exactly how it was supposed to be. Um, I, I think Megan, you said something like there's not a tear in it or like there were just, it yeah. just seemed perfect. And I, and it reminded me of, you know, I read or talking with authors or people who write books and they say, oh, you know, no word, it's no word in a book is accidental. Every phrase is there for a reason. It's intentional. It's, it's there. And you talked for a little bit about how you kind of let the piece make itself or develop itself. And I, I just was wondering if that is, if there's something similar there, like is everything in the work you do supposed to be there the way it is, or is it more about happenstance and accident and material doing the thing it does and then it just happens to look good? Um, well, both really. The, the first uh, vessel that Megan held up was, uh, flask um, or flaska, which means bottle in Swedish. And that was probably the most intentional work that I have done. And that's uh, one of the more recent ones that I've finished. 
And I had the idea beforehand of what I wanted to do. And hopefully I was going to be able to execute that and to bring the shape in and then to make a narrow neck. Um, so that one was very intentional. There's another one you show briefly, Megan, it's called Krem, which means hug in Swedish. And this one was magical. It just happened. Um, it, and why it did, I don't know. It just all came together. The pieces all fit, the stones all fit. And um, it gave me a great sense of accomplishment and pleasure um, to have it just turn out the way I wanted to without even knowing I was going there and doing that. <laughs> so it was, I guess maybe that was a happy accident. I don't know, but um, that doing that basket gave me very much joy. And um, so I wish I could do more that felt that way. Artists really have those magical moments sometimes when they're creating. And um, there's, it's very, very special. I guess it's maybe almost like when you are meditating and you just reach this magical space. And to have that happen in your studio where everything just converges and then this creativity happens is, is very magical. And it doesn't happen often, but it's something that all artists seek and treasure. It's funny that you say that, Martha. I'm a scientist and that same thing happens for scientists very occasionally, but when it does, it is absolutely magic. I, I love that, um, the way you express that. And I think it is, as much as that's the case in art, I think in many ways that's the case in science as well. Thank, Thank you. You're welcome. I love that. Let's see it. I think we have we have a hand raised. That's a that's a new technology for me. Um, <laughs> Cheryl Gray. So based on what you just said, um, and earlier you said you didn't really like working with paints and other traditional media, and I wonder whether that's a function of the relationship that you have with your medium. The way you describe your process, it sounds like a collaboration. That the medium is a presence and a collaborator rather than something that you're trying to execute. And painting, at least in that traditional realist sense, is you're trying to use your medium rather than to invite your medium into a collaborative process. And so question mark, I guess, after that. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think that's very interesting um, take on it. I've never thought of it in that way. And I think um, I'm going to look at it when I work on my next pieces and, and see if that's actually what's happening. Mm. Nice. All right, I think we are just about at time. We couldn't have timed that better if we tried. <laughs> um, I have one little um, shameless plug for our next in the moment. Um, it's in our, uh, our chat as well. Um, it's going to feature Fiddler Earl White, who's based in Floyd. That's going to be July 16th at 12 p.m. Um, you can go to our website, um, which is artcenter.bt.edu, um, to register just like for this one. But I want to um, thank all of you for taking time out of your day to enjoy this chat. And I especially want to thank Martha. Um, and congratulations on, on a, a brighter 2021. Um, and thank you so much for being a part of our show um, and happy making and do keep us posted on, on, on what's, what's coming down the pike for you. Um, Cause I want to, I want to see, especially if you do that wall thing, I want to see. That. I'll call you, you be the oh. first to get the call. Yay. <laughs> Cause I want to see it. Okay. <laughs> you. you all so much. Have a wonderful weekend. Yeah. Thank you all for being Bye. here. Bye. <laughs>